Hello, and welcome to the 100th Hammer tutorial. Today we're going to be making and editing particle systems using the particle editor. There's a few things that you'll need installed on your computer before we can proceed with this tutorial. You'll need Alien Swarm and Alien Swarm SDK, VTF Edit, and GCF Scape. You'll need all three of those installed and ready to go before we can proceed with this tutorial. To install Alien Swarm, as you may not see in your library, go to the Tools section and download Alien Swarm SDK. That will install Alien Swarm. It's about a 4 gigabyte download, and then that will give you the tools. We're using Alien Swarm because Alien Swarm is the newest game to have a working tools mode. Portal 2 and Global Offense, I cannot seem to get tools to work, but if you create particles in Alien Swarm, you can simply drag and drop them into the newer games, and they work fine. So that's why we're using Alien Swarm. GCFscape and VTF Edit will be used for texture creation and editing a little bit later. We're going to begin by opening up Alien Swarm. Or if you would like to use a legacy game, such as Episode 2, open your Steam library and launch it in Tools mode. You can do this by right-clicking on the game, going to Properties, set the launch options, and put Dash Tools in this box. And it will load. Some games are broken. And again, that's why we're using Alien Swarm. So load Alien Swarm in Tools Mode. Once Alien Swarm opens in Tools Mode, you'll be presented with the Source Act Busy tool, a Engine View port, and a File folder menu up the top. Click on Tools, and then go to Particle Editor. You'll lose your Act Busy picture, then click File, and Open. Now you won't see any particles here, because you have to extract them to be able to edit them. So let's go ahead and extract some particle systems. So to extract Alien Swarm's particle systems, we need to go to our Steam Apps folder, Common, Alien Swarm, Swarm, and open up pack01dir.vpk. In this folder we'll see particles, and inside here we'll see all the PCF files. The PCFs are what particles are stored as. Simply just select them all and drag them and drop them into your folder, and overwrite any duplicates. You'll then need a particle manifest file. This should be included by default and will be just sitting in the folder. The particle manifest tells the game what particle systems it needs to load. So here are all the particle systems. You see it's pretty simple. All you'll have to do is add a new line and put your particle system here. My example one is the Boki PCF. So be sure to add your particle system to the particle system manifest and then you'll need to pack that into your level. Now we can open up a particle system. I'm going to open up the FireFX particle system from Alien Swarm. When you open it up, you're presented with some simple elements that should be pretty intuitive to use. You have all of the previews up at the top left of all the particle systems in their animated form. You can click one to select it, and it gives you a viewport and more information on the system. So here's a brief overview of everything that's going on here. Here are our preview windows. These are our controllers down here in the lower left and this is a pr uh, preview of the live particle. Every particle system has eight modifiers to it that are used to create the desired effect that you want. We have system properties, renderer, operators, initializers, emitters, children, force generators, and constraints. The system properties are the overall properties that affect the system. You can change things from the texture that it's loading all the way to rotation and rotation speed and size. Renderers are used to define how the particles get drawn. These include sprites, ropes, streaks, and so forth. Each particle can be drawn multiple times in multiple ways if you wish to do so. Operators come into play after the particle has been initialized. They modify each particle depending on how you tell it to, from oscillation to color fades and so forth. Initializers set up the starting state of each particle. A particle's initial location in space, its color, its size, its alpha, the initializers only set up when the particle is coming to life and nothing further. Emitters define how particles get created, be it instantaneously or over time. The children field allows you to put more particle systems inside of an existing particle system. So for instance, you could have a fire particle and then have a child smoke particle inside of it, so you have two systems at once. You can also set a delay for each child, so you can have more complex particle systems or a control point even. Force generators 
are options that you can use to apply different forces to your particles, such as random movements or pulling to and from a control point or the center of the particle system. A constraint prevents particles from passing through certain areas, such as brushes. They can also be defined such as two-dimensional planes in your particle system that are invisible, almost like a clip brush, but only for particles. So that's a brief overview of your particle system options. Let's go ahead and get started with some basic particle system creation now. Click File, New, and then click File, Save As, and then give your particle system a name. That's what you'll need to add to your particle manifest file. Now to create a new system within the PCF, click Create. Now enter a name for it. I'm going to name mine Simple Fire, as that's the first particle we're going to be making. The first thing you'll want to change is the material. Click this little arrow to open up the texture browser. This should look pretty familiar. You can just navigate around to find the particle you want. I'm going to use this bokeh particle effect that's used in some photo filters. We need to add some things to get the particles to spawn and render correctly. So the first thing that we need to add is a renderer. Right click on renderer and hit add. Then click render animated sprites and then click open. You won't need to change anything here for this particle. We'll get to these controllers later. The next thing you'll need to add is an emitter. Right click on emitter and hit add and then click emit continuously. You'll then see that your particles are starting to stack up and the particle count is going up as well and it'll cap at 1004. This is completely normal. Particles don't die unless you add a controller to tell them to die. So now let's do that now. Under Operator, right click, hit Add, and add a lifespan decay. The lifespan of particles is automatically one second flat. So now you'll see that we're emitting 100 particles a second, as designated by this emitter. The emission rate is 100. We can change this to 60. That should probably be good for our needs. Now we need to add some gravity and the controller to let things move. So right click on operators and hit add. Scroll down and add a movement basic. If you want particles to move, you'll need a movement basic no matter what. Click open and you'll still see that nothing's happening. We have a few controllers that we'll need to modify here. We have drag and gravity. For this particle, we're only going to use gravity. This is an X, Y, and Z coordinate. So for the last zero, I'm going to change this to be 60. And you'll see our particles spring to life and instantly start floating up to the top. I want a little bit more gravity, so I'm going to increase this number. If you'd also like, you can make the particles go the other way by adding a negative in front of it. But since it's fire and fire rises, this is what we'll use. Now what we'll need to do is add an initializer. Initializers are the things that affect them how they spawn. So we're going to add a lifetime random. The lifetime random chooses how long a particle should live. Right now, since the lifetime min and max are both zero, they're just going to die as soon as they spawn. So I'm going to have them live for 2.5 to 2.75 seconds. That's a bit too much. I'm going to go ahead and change that. Actually, that's a lot too much, so I'm going to make it 0.75 and 1. That seems pretty good. Now we're going to add some randomness to how they spawn. So right click on initializers and hit add. And then choose position within box random. Nothing's changed yet, but we're going to define where the particles can spawn. In the max, I'm going to put 5, 5, 0. And in the minimum, I'm going to put negative 5, negative 5, 0. This will allow them to spawn in this little box here. So there's some more randomness to it. Next, we need to add some color to our particles, so they look like they're actually fire. In Initializers, click Add, and then Color Random. For Color 1, I'm going to choose an orange. For Color 2, I'm going to choose something close to the first color, but a little more towards the red side. It'll now randomly pick between these two colors as the particles spawn, but they look a little strange being all the same size. So now, we're going to add something that'll randomly change their radius, or size, whenever they spawn. So right click on initializers and hit add. And then scroll down to radius random. You'll notice all the particles got smaller. This is because the radius is now set to 1 and 1. Change the minimum to 5. No, nope, that's a bit too much. So I'm going to change the minimum to 3 and the maximum to 4.5. We'll now see that our particles are randomly sized. 
If you're still not happy with that, you can make them be more dramatic by 2 and 4.5. That looks pretty good. Now we need them to fade in and out of existence. This will make them look a bit more convincing. So in operators, click add and alpha fade out random. What the alpha fade out random does, it allows you to choose how long they fade out for. Currently, it's 0.25%. You can change this value to be larger or smaller. Just play with it and you'll figure out what it does. We also want one to fade in, but we don't want this to be random fade in. We want this to be a alpha fade in simple. This will always be the same amount of fade in time, but I want them to fade in a little bit faster than that. So if I decrease the time, they should come into existence much quicker. Now we want to add a bit more dynamic to this fire. We're going to have the particles be randomly alpha whenever they're brought into existence. So right click on initializers and hit add, alpha random. Alpha random does exactly what it says. It allows you to pick between two values and it randomly assigns an alpha to each particle. I'm going to have my alpha be 80 and 160. Now the particles are not as dense as they were before. Fire is typically blue at the bottom and orange at the top. So I want to add a color fade to make them start blue and then transition into orange. So I'm going to right click on operators and click add and then select color fade. The color I want is a bluish teal color. That looks good, but now our fire is going from orange to blue. This is in fact the opposite effect that we want. We can invert this by changing the start time to 1 and the end time to 0. This effectively flips, but they stay blue a bit too long. We can actually trick the system by putting a negative value into the end time. So if you put negative 0.2, that creates the effect that I want a little bit more. We're almost finished with our particle. The last thing we have to do is set the max amount of particles that can be created for this system. Particle systems are allocated a static amount of memory, and whether the particles actually use it or not, it's being taken up by the system. So to set this lower, we change the max particles here on the system properties tab. We set this number to be what the max amount of particles can possibly be within the system. To figure this out, you'll just go to emit continuously, and we're emitting at 60 particles a second. So now we'll go to our lifetime random. 60, with a maximum lifetime of 1, is there's a max possible of 60 particles. So we'll just go to our system properties and set the max particles to 60. Once we hit enter, you'll see it change from 1004 to 64. For some reason, it always says plus 4 to whatever amount you put at the end. Just live with it. Next, click save. Now I'll show you how you can implement this particle system into a level and test it within the particle editor. So we'll need to go to Aliens Form SDK and go ahead and click on Hammer World Editor. And in addition, we also need to go to our Alien Swarm game files. So browse to Steam Apps, Common, Alien Swarm, Swarm, and then Particles. We're not going to add it to the particle manifest like I told you guys earlier in the tutorial. So just select this line, copy it, tab over, paste the line, and put in your particle system name. Mine is Tutorial. Save the particle system, and then close out of the editor. We'll now need to restart the Alien Swarm tools for that to take effect, so exit for now. Now we're going to implement it into a level and then test it. So click File, New. If you've never mapped for Alien Swarm before, it's a bit different seen as it's a top-down view. So to create a basic level for Alien Swarm, just create a box and then go to Tools, Make Hollow, and hollow it out with a negative 16 value. Inside you'll place a player spawn. Move him off to the side and raise him up off the ground a little bit so you don't get stuck in the floor or an invalid spawn point. Now create a new entity and this is going to be your info particle system. Hit apply and then go to particle system name. You can click browse. Your particle browser may error like this. Simply close it and reopen it to resolve that issue. You'll now see all the particles in the browser, like the model browser. You can type in the name of your particle over to the right. Here's our particle system. Double click it to select it. Now you'll need to tell it to start as active. There are two inputs to an info particle system, start and stop. They do exactly what they say. It's pretty easy to figure out. Now we need to compile our level for Alien Swarm, and then click Run Map. You'll need to switch over to Expert Mode, because we need to make a few changes here for our simple test map to work. In the default configuration, we're going to click Edit, and we're going to copy this. I'm simply going to name it Test. We need to perform a few minor adjustments to this to get our compile to work correctly. First, remove the Game command. 
Next, in Viz, you want to remove Radius Override 2500. And in the BSP command, you want to remove all detail. Now this will just compile the level and allow you to test the particle system relatively quickly. Click Go. It'll quickly compile the level. Now we can restart Alien Swarm into Tools mode. Switch back to the particle editor, and then load up our particle system. Once we have the particle system loaded, we're going to want to test it. There's a console command that we have to fire before our map will actually load. You'll get a Steam validation error if you don't put this command in. So down in the lower left where it says BX console, type SV underscore LAN space 1. This will allow you to test the map. So now type map space the map name. And it should load the level. You'll now see that you have a viewport in the top right. You have two commands, F10 for switch mode and F11 for full screen. Hit F11 and F10 until your game goes full. Then you'll need to select a player for Alien Swarm to be able to play. Click ready and you should load up in. You'll now see why we have our particle system in the game. If you want to zoom in in Alien Swarm, you can do this by opening the console and typing in FOV desired and setting this to a lower value. 30 will get you pretty close. There's other console commands to change the angle, but this is just a simple way to test how the particle system will look in-game. You can press F10 to go back to normal mode, and now here we can edit our particle again. The particle will actually change in real time, so say I make a change of the color fade to make it be purple instead of blue. We see that the particle instantly reflected that change in the world. Now let's go ahead and start making our next particle system. Click the create button like you did before to create the next particle. I'm going to call it tree. Now we need to add the same controllers that we did before and specify a texture. So I'm going to start with the texture, do a search for leaf, and here's my leaf texture that I have. Renderers, add. Render animated sprites. Emitter, add. Emit instantaneously. Emit instantaneously creates all the particles at once. This is good if you want to have, say, an earthquake, emit all the tree leaves at once. And I'm also going to team this with an emit continuously to add like there's some trailing leaves falling behind it. So the emission rate for the emit continuously is going to be 10. And the emit instantaneously is going to be 50. So we'll have a continuous emission of 10 and an instantaneous emission of 50. But I only want the emit continuously to emit for about 5 seconds and then it will stop. Now we need to add our lifetimes. So we're going to do lifespan decay, initializer, and lifetime random. I want these particles to stick around for about 6 seconds minimum, 12 seconds maximum. Now we'll add a movement basic to give them some life, and we'll add some basic gravity. That might be a bit too fast for leaves, so I'm going to slow it down to 40. That seems good. We'll go to initializers, add radius random to begin with, so we want the leaves to be smaller and larger depending on our desire, 5 and 3. Now for the actual rotation. We need a rotation basic operator to allow the particles to rotate. So go to operators, add, and select rotation basic. Now we can go to initializers, click add, and select rotation random. Rotation random automatically rotates each particle as it spawns, but they don't spin, so they're completely static. It has two controllers that you'll use, rotation min and max, and that just chooses how much they rotate when they spawn. Now to make them spin randomly, go to initializers, add, and select rotation speed random. This will make the particles spin a random amount of speed in either direction. The two main controllers that you'll use are rotation speed random max and minimum. This is the speed in units per second that they'll rotate when they spawn. I'm going to set mine to 120. So they rotate a little bit slower now. It just brings them to life a little bit more. But since a tree doesn't have all its leaves spawn in the middle, we want to make it be random and have an arch to it like it. So under initializers, right click, select add, and choose position within sphere random. Now we need to change our distance min and max. Select the distance max and I'm going to make mine about 50. There we go, they all spawned within the tree. But a tree isn't perfectly spherical, it's usually on the top only. So I only want these particles to spawn in the top. You can use the distance bias for this. We have an x, y, z, and each one of these numbers represents a coordinate in the sphere. If we change the first one to a 1, you'll see that they only spawn in half of the sphere now. But that's not the half I want. I only want them to spawn in the top half of the sphere. So I want to change the last one, the z, to a 1. Now the particles only spawn in the top half of the tree. 
This is exactly what I want. Now we need to add some oscillation to them. This will make them act like leaves that sway as they fall to the ground. Right click on Operator, click Add, and then choose Oscillate Vector. There's a few controllers that we'll use in this. We'll use Oscillation Frequency Min and Max, Oscillation Rate Min and Max. You'll see that they're all XYZ coordinates. Right now, Min and Max are both set to 1 for the frequency, and the rate is all zeros. We're going to kick up the frequency max and set this to about 8 on the X and Y. You'll see that there's really no difference because we need to set the rate before it'll take effect. So under the rate, I'm going to set the X and Y to 2. We'll now see that the leaves are kind of swaying, but they're a little too sporadic. We need to turn down this amount. And with a bit of fine tuning, you'll get exactly the effect that you want. I have these set at 991 and then 0.5 plus and minus for the min and max rate. That's about the effect that I want. We need to make the leaves collide with the ground, as leaves actually would. We need a constraint to do this. So right click on constraint, hit add, and click collision via traces. We don't need to control anything here, but there are a few controllers. The controllers that you might actually consider using are amount of bounce, amount of slide, and kill on particle collision, or brush only. They're pretty self-explanatory, and you can play with these, but I don't think leaves would bounce or slide, so I'm just going to let them be. We now need an effect to make the leaves fade out right before their death. So this is an operator. Right-click and add the alpha fade out random. I'm going to make them fade out with a max of 0.5. This should be pretty good. And their fade in time is going to be a simple fade in. So they just fade in as they spawn. But I'm going to make them spawn a bit quicker into life. Now I'm going to click save. And I'm going to test the particle. I need to turn on SVLAN1. And then load the test map. Now if you load up your map and you notice that the particles aren't firing. This is because emit instantaneously will only play the particle once. Once they're emitted it stops the system. So we need to restart the system. The easiest way to do that is with a bind. We're going to create this bind now. I'll display the bind on the screen. Now when you hit H, it'll stop all info particle systems, wait a small amount of time, and then start them up again. So now hit H, and you'll see our particle system springs to life again. And it also collides with the ground and with the player, as you can see that the particles are staying on top of me, and they fall to the ground as soon as they fall off of me. Once you're done in game mode, hit F10 and F11 to switch out of game mode, and then in the bottom, type disconnect, and it will close out of the engine viewport. Now we're going to edit our simple fire particle to become a candle instead, so start by duplicating it, and now we need to remove the modifiers that we've put in place to make it a fire instead of a candle. So remove position within box random, now we also need to tone down the size and the emission rate of these particles. Start by going to lifetime random and changing this to be 0.5 and about 0.65. Next change the radius random to be 2 to 2.5. The particles are now overall smaller and the flame is smaller as well. Now go to movement basic and set the gravity and set it from 80 to about 5. This is in fact not how they're going to look when they're done. Now we need to add an initializer of velocity noise. This will make them actually act like a candle. You'll notice that the particles are freaking out and shooting every which way. There's two things that we have to add to get this initializer to function properly. So start by adding an operator of movement max velocity. And under maximum velocity, set this value to 60. Now we need to go to initializers, click add, and select position within sphere random. You don't need to configure anything on this, just having this makes the particles act correctly. Now go to our velocity noise, and under output maximum and output minimum, this is what we're going to configure. In the output maximum, I'm going to put 30, 30, and 110. In the output minimum, I'm going to put negative 30, negative 30, and 50. And I'm going to change that 110 in the top to be 60 instead. They're still moving a bit too fast, I want to slow it down quite a bit. So I'm going to go to 30 and 20. There we go. That seems a bit more like a candle would act in the wind. If you want to make it less dramatic in the waviness, you turn down the x and y value. So I'm going to set mine to 10, 10, and negative 10, negative 10. That's better. Now we need to make the particles get smaller as they reach the end of their lifetime. This is an operator. Right click operators, add, and select radius scale. 
We're going to use the end, start, scale bias, and scale time to create the effect that we want. In the end scale, I'm going to put 0.5. This will make the particles reach half of their spawning size by the time they reach the end. But they're still getting random sizes from the radius random. We want to make this less dramatic. So I'm going to change mine to 2.25. That's a bit better. So now in our radius scale, we're going to change the bias time. This will make them get thinner quicker or stay fatter longer. You can use the scroll wheel to fine tune this. We're also going to change the start time to delay how soon this controller takes effect. I'm just going to set a little bit. So now it looks like the, at the base of the particle, the candle is burning wider and brighter. There we go. That's a quick little candle particle. It was pretty simple, wasn't it? Now we're going to create a particle system that requires us to restart Alien Swarm. This is actually going to be an animated particle that we're going to create on a sprite card. So I'll start by exiting Alien Swarm, and you'll need to create all of your particles as separate TGA files and place them in a folder. I have mine here of a simple bird flapping animation that was done with watercolor. Now we're going to right click, click new, and create a new text document. We're going to name this bird, and its file type is going to be M. K S. Now open this file with Notepad or Notepad++, whichever you prefer. Now we're going to tell it how to sequence our animated texture. We're going to start out by typing sequence and then zero. We want this animation to loop, so we're going to type loop. Now we're going to specify what frames we want in the animation and then the file name. Now we need to specify how long the frame will play for. This is going to be 1. Now we're going to copy this line and make one for each frame. But what if we don't want it to loop? What if we want it to play once and that's it? Then we can copy the whole sequence, change its sequence to sequence 1, and then get rid of loop. Now it won't loop. But we can still change this even further. So we're going to create another sequence called sequence 3, or 2. And now we're going to make our bird hold its wings in an outward position as it flaps. We're going to do this with the frame. So frame, it should go frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4, and then hover at 4 for a little bit, and then continue on. So it's going to go frame 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and back to frame 4, but it's going to hover there for a little while. Then it's going to continue out all the way to frame 9. And then it's going to loop. This is to show you that you can use multiple images in the same frame. Now if we want just a still image in a frame, we can do that too. So let's say I want image 1 to be in its own sequence. We just create a sequence 3, and we put the frame in there. This is very basic animated sprite creation. You can learn a lot more from this on the VDC. I'll post a link in the video. Now we need to compile the texture. Unlike standard VTF creation, these textures don't need to be powers of 2. But to compile it, we need to open up our source SDK content folder. So for this, you need to go to your account and then source SDK. Inside source SDK, navigate to bin, source 2009, and then bin. Now move that window off to the side while we place our textures in the correct location. Open another window, but this time browse to your alien swarm directory. Common alien swarm swarm. We need to create a folder in here called material src. Now we need to copy our folder containing our animation into this folder. Mine is called breadcrumbs. Now in our source 2009 bin folder, we're looking for a exe called mk sheet. Simply drag your mks file onto the mk sheet. It will now create the TGA for you. We can see by the thumbnail that it's created all the frames needed for the animated sprite. Even though we've used some frames twice, it hasn't added them to the sprite card more than once. Now we need to convert this to a VTF. We can't use VTF edit because it compiles this newly created SHT file into the TGA. So now, Scroll down in 2009 bin to vtex.exe. Drag your TGA onto vtex.exe and it'll compile. You'll see that it automatically found the SHT file 
and it'll say success VTF file created and it will tell you where it's put it we can now go to swarm materials and breadcrumbs now we need to create a VTF so this is what your VMT needs to look like it needs to have the shader of sprite card and then vertex color 1 vertex alpha 1 and translucent this is just standard VMT creation you should know how to do this already if you don't, you can look up on the BDC on how to create your own VMTs. Now we'll reload Aliens Form, browse to our particle editor, and reopen the system. Now let's go ahead and create our particle system of swarming birds. Click Create. I'm not going to show you guys how to add all these basic controllers again, as we've already done it twice. I'll just put a list of the ones that I'm using. Now that I'm selecting my texture, I can browse through all the sequences and play back the animation, faster or slower. It says one of four sequences. Sequence 0 is the one that loops. Sequence 2 is the one that stops at the end. The texture browser just loops it infinitely. Sequence 2 is the one where it holds the down frame for a little while and looks like it's flapping a little bit. And the last sequence is just the single frame. I want just the normal sequence of them constantly flap. That should just about do it for the controllers that I need now. To get the birds to animate, you need to go to Render Animated Sprites and turn up the animation rate. You should now see them start to flap. It's a bit hard to see, but they're doing it. Now in Initializers, we need to add something that's going to make them fly about randomly. So we're going to add a Velocity Random. In our velocity random, we're going to set the speed in the local coordinate system to be 30, 30, negative 30, and negative 30. Now we also want them to go up and down slightly, so I'm going to set it to 5 and negative 5 on the z-axis. This will just make them fly around randomly, but this isn't quite what we want. We want almost a tornado of birds. So under force generators, click add, and click twist around axis. We need to add a force to make them actually twist. So we can add 60, and you should start to see them swing in. But they're just swinging outwards, because they're twisting around the axis. Now we need a controller to pull them into the center, so they don't fly away too far. So go to Force Generators, Add, and select Pull Towards Control Point. Control Point 0 is right in the center, where our helper model is. Set your falloff to point 1, and the force to a number that you're happy with. I'm going to use 60. You'll start to see the birds swing around in the center. That's still a bit too much, so I'm going to turn up the falloff distance and turn down the force inwards. Now the birds are just starting to fly around the axis. They're still kind of falling outwards, so we're just going to add a constraint to prevent them from going out that far. So right-click on Constraint and click Add. Now we're going to select Constraint Distance to Control Point. Now we'll see that our birds are actually stuck in this little bubble here. We can increase this distance by changing the maximum distance here. I'm going to change it to 200. Now our birds are stuck in a 200 by 200 little bubble, and it's just a tornado of them, and we can see that they're animating. But they're moving way too fast, so again, we'll tweak it to turn down the axis spin. Now we're going to add some oscillation to make the birds look like they're flying around a bit more lifelike. So select Operators, Add, Oscillate Vector. We need to set this to a rather powerful amount, so I'm going to do 60. 60, 20, negative 60, negative 60, negative 20. The birds should seem to fly around in quite an unpredictable pattern. Now we want the birds to face the way that they're actually flying. So under renderers, select add, and then choose render screen velocity rotate. We also want to turn down the emission of these birds so we can see them. The birds will now face the direction that they're rotating. They may be rotated improperly, so you'll need to modify that. Mine are rotated what it looks like to be 90 degrees. So in the forward angle, you simply change this number. There we go. Now the birds are actually flapping their wings in the way that they're flying. We're now going to make a waterfall particle. So create it and name it. And then select the texture. The texture that I'm using is from Water Source Particles, and it's the waterfall particle. You can download these from my website if you'd like to use the same one. Under Renderer, I'm going to add a Render Sprite Trail. This is the renderer that we'll use. We're not using animated sprites for this one. Under Emitter, we're going to choose Emit Continuously. We're going to set it to 80. So under Operator, add a Movement Basic and apply a Downward Gravity to it, about 150. There we go. We now see the particles springing to life. 
And we're going to add the rest of our operators of a lifespan decay, a alpha fade in simple, and an alpha fade out random. I'm going to change its min time to 0.15. Under initializers, we're going to select lifetime random, the minimum time being 2 and the maximum time being 2.5. We're now going to add initializer, position within box random. And we're going to set our maximum to 40 and our minimum to negative 40. We'll now see that we have a yellow line and the particles are spawning across this line. We're now going to add a velocity random to give them some speed. In the max, put 20, and in the min, put 15. You should now see the particles shooting off to one side. They're still really small, so we need to increase this side. So under initializer, click add, and radius random. You'll now see that they're very small particles. When we turn up the radius max to 5 and the radius min to 3.5, you'll see that they've gotten wider, but they're not longer. We actually changed their max length in the render sprite. So under minimum length and maximum length, we're going to change these to affect how large or small the particles are. A render sprite trail, as the particles move, they get longer. So in the minimum length, we're going to set this to be 100. And you'll now see that the particles are really long. But this is not how a waterfall looks. So we're actually going to set it to 25. That's a bit better. So now we need to turn the radius up more. Okay, so after a bit of playing and turning up the emission rate, setting the minimum length to 40, and setting my radius to 25 and 24, I finally have something that I'm pretty happy with. Now we're just going to add a few more things to make this waterfall look more convincing. We're going to add an initializer of alpha random of a minimum of 80, and a maximum of 180. And we need to add a color random to give them a nice blue tint. And there we go. We have our waterfall particle. I'm now going to show you how you can add children to a particle system. So I'm going to hop over to another system that I used for testing. And I'm going to create a new system. So in these particle systems, I have all these bokeh effects of just different colors. So I'm going to combine the purple with the red. To do this, I'm just going to select the bokeh blend, right-click on children, click add, and select red. We'll now see that the red particles are starting to spawn. I'm now also going to do this again, and select purple. And we'll see we have the red and purple particle effects spawning within the same system. Now you can add this single particle system to your level, and it'll have both of them within the same one. I hope this tutorial helped you create and or modify custom particle systems. If you have any questions, leave a comment. Or you can go to my website and shoot me an email at tophatwaffle.com. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe, and happy mapping!